بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله ولي الصالحين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين اللهم صل وسلم على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد All praises are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds, and surely Allah is the friend and protector of the righteous. And I bear witness that Allah is one and has no partners, and that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, is his servant and his last messenger. And may Allah always and constantly send peace and blessings to Muhammad, to his family, to his companions, to all those who call to his way and establish his sunnah to the day of judgment. As to what follows, my beloved brothers and sisters, I begin with the greeting words of the righteous. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I want to bring you special salams from your brothers and sisters in Toronto, in Canada. There, alhamdulillah, Muslims now make up about 10% of the GTA, the population of Toronto. Out of 2.5 million people, there's over 250,000 Muslims. By the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal, Islam is going north. It has reached the North Pole. At the North Pole, there is a masjid at the top of the earth. And so, in the far off reaches of the world, Islam has spread. In the deep south, in Australia, Islam has spread to the Aboriginal people. Recently I was there in Melbourne, Australia and a chief from the Aboriginal clans had accepted Islam and his people were also accepting Islam. And so in the far off reaches of the world, this final message, the last testament, the last messenger, Muhammad wasalam, his words are reaching people of different colors, different nationalities and different uh, ways of life. But what is happening today in the world is that we are living in a world of illusion. And that is that you see one thing and the reality is something different. Especially at this time of year as we end the solar year and we are going toward what they say is the new year we are entering into a new Islamic year, we have entered into the month of Muharram. People are thinking about time, they're thinking about the future. Tonight they come together and they watch a golden uh, ball. They look to this fire, the sun, to begin their year. But there is an illusion that is happening. There is a fantastic world which has been made for you and me which is not the reality on the ground. And we should never forget the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who tells us very clearly when we are speaking about time that Allah Azza, Azza wa Jal has told us A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim Ya ayyuha alladheena amunu taqullaha wal tandu nafsun ma qaddamat li ghad wa taqullah inna allaha khabirun bima ta'maloon وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنْفُسَهُمْ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ Allah tells us, O you who believe, have the consciousness of Allah and let every soul look to what it put forward for tomorrow and fear Allah. Surely Allah is well aware of all that you do. And be not as those who forgot Allah and so He made them forget themselves. Surely they are the disobedient ones. So Allah tells us in this verse that you should always be aware of the presence of your Lord. Inside of the masjid and outside. On Juma or on Saturday. Friday during the day, Friday night. At school, at work, wherever you are, remember that there is one who is closer to you than your juggler vein. And Allah with His knowledge is closer to us than anything. He knows what we do in the secret 
and he knows what we do in the open. And so we need to have the consciousness of Allah. Never forget that there is one who is watching over you. And Allah said, every soul look to the future. Well, tandu nafsun ma qaddama lighat. Each soul should look, what did you do for tomorrow? Look at your year last year. What did you do in the last year? What have you done for Islam? What have you done for yourself? What have you done for your family? What righteous thing did you do and did you put forward for the future? Then Allah tells us, be not as those who forgot Allah, He will make them forget themselves. Surely they are the disobedient ones. And so when we see this, we can realize what is happening to the Muslim world. I am just coming back right now from Istanbul, from Turkey. And when you are in Istanbul, you will see masjids on the size like you have never seen before. You will see the strength that Islam had. You will see the government that Muslims had that ruled over much of the known world. But when they forgot Allah, He made them forget themselves. And so their very power, which was at one time making the world a place of peace and security, is now being used against themselves. When you look at many parts of the Gulf region, you will see people with so much money, so much wealth, they don't know what to do with it. But there are other Muslims in other parts of the world who have just enough food to break their fast. It is the same Ummah, the same nation. Why is there one group that has so much wealth and there are other people who are starving to death? Why is it that scholars, our great scholars, that we have today, so much knowledge that we have, which can answer the problems of the world. So much knowledge is in front of us, in our hands. Why is this knowledge not solving the problems of the world? The problems of racism, the problems of the banking system. When you say you're a Muslim, you have to realize it is more than just wearing a kufi. We, in, we represent the last messenger ca that came to humanity. We represent the best human being ever lived on the face of the planet Earth. We represent the last testament, the last form of wahi, the last revelation that came to human beings. We have the ultimate declaration of independence. You know in America they have this thing they say, declaration of independence. That means I am free. We are free of the spirit world. Today around the world, the magicians are on the rise. The Sahara. They come in all countries. They deal with the jinn. They are casting spells. They are setting up a secret society. They are trying to tell the future. Even here in the UK amongst the young people, they also are, are, are trying to push this in a secret way. Their new hero is Harry Potter that you know with Harry Potter society. He is a magician. He is a sahir. And he represents a secret society. And when you read the Fatiha, you have the Declaration of Independence, and that is, Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nistayin. With this sentence alone, we say, you Allah, alone do we worship, and from you we seek help and assistance. This is freedom from the jinn, freedom from the Sahara, freedom from all the forms of magic and all the forms of shirk. We also have an interest-free banking system. When the recession struck the countries of the world and the people's money started to go down, the Islamic banks had no losses. I was amongst the people in the country of Bahrain. And the Islamic banks during the recession had no losses. They made gains. They didn't want to tell the world. They were afraid to be attacked. But the reality is we have something. We have a system which can save the world economic crisis. 
We have a system that can save the world of racism. There is racism today in all of the countries. One group hates another group. One tribe hates another tribe. One country hates another country. But if we practice Islam, it should take us away from racism, away from tribalism, away from the hatred of a person because of the color of their skin. The Prophet ﷺ said very clearly, there is no preference of the Arabs over the non-Arabs, or the non-Arabs over the Arabs. There's no preference of white over black or the opposite. Illa bit taqwa. It is only with taqwa that we see a difference between human beings. And so we have this beautiful system to give to the world. We have large numbers, we have wealth, but there is an illusion. There is an illusion being painted in front of us. The first reality we have to deal with is in ourselves. That is the first reality. As we cry for change, we cry for economic change, we cry for political change, we cry for Islamic social system, Islamic banking. But Allah told us, "In Allah la yughayru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayru ma bi anfusihim." Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. It's in the heart. That is where the change begins. But in front of us is an illusion. There is a false world, which is being painted in front of us. It comes on television, in the movies, and now on Facebook, on Twitter. It comes in, in the new social networking, coming to our people. And the Prophet ﷺ did not speak from himself. The Prophet, peace be upon him, spoke from above seven heavens. وَمَا يَمْتِكُوا عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَىٰ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ He did not speak from himself. But revelation comes through him, and he gives it to you. The Prophet ﷺ said in authentic hadith reported in At-Tabarani, يَكُونُ فِي أَخِرِ الزَّمَانِ كَذَّابُونَ دَجَّالُونَ يَأْتُونَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَ حَدِيثِ بِمَا لَمْ تَسْمَعُوا أَنْتُمْ وَلَا أَبَعُكُمْ فَإِيَّاكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ لَا يُضِلُّونَكُمْ وَلَا يُفْتِنُونَكُمْ The Prophet ﷺ said, there will come near the end of time great liars, like false Christ, false prophets. They will come to you with a type of speech that neither you nor your parents have ever heard of before. Beware of them. Beware that they take you astray. Beware that they put you into a fitna, a trial, a tribulation. Sadaqa Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam, it has come to pass. What did the Prophet say? They will come to you with a type of speech that neither you nor your parents have ever heard of before. Digital technology. Now they have the ability to make false things seem real. And to make what is true appear to be false. They can take your picture, they can take your voice, they can put words in your mouth, and they can make a picture, and you didn't say it. But people will think it is real. Beware of them. Beware that they take you astray. And beware that they put you into a fitna. This is an illusion. Tonight they say, it is New Year's Eve. And the people are gathering around to celebrate the coming of a new year. It is a lie. It is not the New Year's. How can you say this? Because when you count, when you go back to the early calendars used by the European people, in Latin language, in the Roman calendar, September is from septum, it's seven. October is eight, like octagon, eight sides, right? November is nine, and December is ten. That means January is the 11th month. And February is the 12th. The new year was originally in March. Why is it now January 1st? Why are they deceiving us? 
Why is an illusion? You think it's the new year, they go and they see the ball go up and they say now it's a new year and they laugh and they drink alcohol and they commit adultery and they rape and they murder. It's a new year. It is not the new year. Number one, it is the time of the winter season. December 25th. It used to be their ceremony of the Bacchanalia and the Saturnalia. They used to worship the sun god because it is so cold in the winter as we live here in these countries. It is so cold, the darkness is long. So they used to pray to the sun god to come back. And they put up Christmas trees in their houses as a type of tamima, a type of uh, 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 amulet to protect them from evil things and give them life inside of their homes. It is not the birthday of Christ. Esau was born in the warm weather. The Christians will tell you, when Jesus was born, the shepherds had their flocks outside. You can't keep your animals outside in Philistine at this time at night. It's too cold. He was born in the warm weather. They were paying taxes. That means that their, their plants were ripened. In the Quranic uh, discussion, Maryam, may Allah, may Allah be pleased with her, Allah sent the message to her that she should go to the Nakhla, she should shake the palm tree, and she would get the Rutub, she would get the ripe dates. When does the ripened dates come? In the summer, in the heat. Then you have this ripened dates. So it is agreed upon by the scholars that December 25th is not the birthday of Christ. It is the time of the pagan gods of the winter. They drink and they fight. Why do you think on Christmas? So many people die on the road in accidents because they're drinking alcohol. There is more people who are killed, more people who are raped, more houses that are robbed, more lying and stealing and cheating, which is done around Christmas time than any time of the year. Is that Jesus? No. Is that Isa alayhi salam? No. He was a mighty messenger of Allah. That is not the time of Isa alayhi salam. It is the time of the pagan gods, of the mushrikeen. That is why they put up the trees. But the Christian church, when they saw the mushrikeen were gaining power, they banned Christmas. Up until 1647, the parliament here in the UK, they said no Christmas. It's against the law and they would not allow them to celebrate the Christmas uh, uh, vacation. They would not allow them to do that. And so they changed, they took the, the, the magic of Christmas and they put it on January. Why did they choose January? You will see when you study history, January was named after the pagan god Janus. And Janus is the person with two faces. He shows you one face, but he has another face. He's a deceiver. And that is what we are in now, a time of deception. The Prophet ﷺ also said, Tajidu min shiraran nas, yawm al qiyamati in the law, dhul wajhain, alladhi ya'ti ha'ula'i bi wajhin, wa ha'ula'i bi wajh. He said, you will find the most hated and despicable of people on the day of resurrection is Dhu Wajhain. He has two faces. He comes to one person with one face, one group, and he goes to another with another face. He comes inside the masjid, you see him in the masjid, you see him in his home, and he is a good boy, he is Bilal. Bilal is a good Muslim. Ali is there, Asya. But when Bilal goes outside to his friends, he puts the hat on, Bilal becomes Billy. <laughs> Muhammad becomes Mo. Asya becomes Asia. And he changes. You thought he was a nice Bilal inside here. And then he goes down to Trafal Trafalgar Square around 12 o'clock, it's no Bilal anymore, there's Billy. This is two faces. He comes to one group with one face, 
and to another group with another face. He's a hypocrite. He won't tell you about his real self. And so this pagan holiday is set up to confuse you. They say, oh, it's happiness of the new year. It is not the new year. And secondly, when the happiness comes, they drink alcohol. When New Year's come, they say, take a drink. They have proven now, a new study has come out in Canada, and it has shown alcohol is more dangerous to a person than cocaine and heroin. This is a new study. Alcohol is more dangerous than cocaine. It is more dangerous than heroin. It is drugs in liquid form. When you take the drugs, when you take the alcohol, it ruins your body, it destroys your liver, it destroys your ability to, to think right, you can't walk straight, you get in a car, you get in an accident, the man comes home and he fights his wife, he beats his children, he rapes, he cannot see straight, it destroys him and then he wants to drink some more alcohol. So he continues, he is a drug addict. He is worse than a person on heroin and cocaine. But they will tell you here, no, alcohol is a good thing. If you have a problem, take a drink and your problem will go away. It's a lie. When you drink the alcohol and become drunk, your problem does not go away and the next day you have a headache and your problem is worse. So it is a lie and a confusion which is being spread around in the name of a good season. That is the illusion. And so Muslims today are called upon to break the illusion. You have to deal with reality. That means when we read the Quran, you need to read it not just as a book that you read for tilawa. You don't just read it. As one of the great scholars of the Sahara Desert used to say, you want to be sincere to the Qur'an, you need three things. Tahseen tilawatihi, wa tadabbur ayatihi, wa itba' awamirihi. Three things. You read it in a beautiful way with tajweed. Secondly, tadabbur ayatihi. You have to think about it, reflect. Reflect on the verses. Don't just read it and put it away. Think about what it's saying. And finally, you have to follow what it is saying. You have to follow it. So we are at a very critical point in our history. The life of this world, the dunya, is on us. We are suffering from either too much money or too little money. We're in extremes. And Allah told us, وَمَا الْحَيَاةِ dunya إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُوَةِ the life of this world is nothing but material deception. And so we need to seek refuge in the Qur'an to deal with our present situation. What is the divine formula for our present situation? You need to look at the life of the Prophet Wasallam, understand what he did, understand the revelation that came. I want to share with you just one uh, uh, section from this divine revelation which will give us a formula, a divine formula to deal with the hayat dunya and to deal with the problems we are facing. In Surah Ashura, shura verses 36 to 39, Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ فَمَا أُتِيتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَمَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ وَالَّذِينَ يَجْتَنِبُونَ كَبَائِلَ الْإِثْمِ وَالْفَوَاحِشِ وَإِذَا غَضِبُوا هُمْ يَغْفِرُونَ وَالَّذِينَ اسْتَجَابُوا لِرَبِّهِمْ وَأَقَامِ الصَّلَاةِ وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورًا بَيْنَهُمْ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَهُمْ الْبَغِي هُمْ يَنْتَصِرُونَ This is a divine formula. What is inside of this? Allah tells us, whatever you are given in this world is but enjoyment of this life. But that which is with Allah is better and more lasting. It is for those who believe. 
and put their trust in their Lord. Those who avoid the major sins and indecency, and when they are angry, even then they forgive. Those who respond to their Lord and establish regular prayer and conduct their affairs by mutual consultation. And from what we have given them, they spend. And those who when an oppressive wrong is done to them, they stand up and they defend themselves. This is a divine formula. What is it telling us? This is a program for survival. We need to survive. Outside, there is traps waiting for you. There are traps of drugs. There are traps of alcohol. There are traps of gambling. There are traps of HIV, AIDS, and sexually transmitted diseases. There are traps of homelessness. There are traps of racism. How can you survive this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a survival program. What is the survival program? Number one, to recognize that the life of this world is a deception. It is a test. We live in the dunya for a short period of time. Just a short period of time. If a person lives to be 100 years old, that's a long time he lived. But compare his 100 years to the next life, which is eternal life. As Allah described, خَالِدِينَ fiha abadan. They will live in the next life forever. Compare it. If you divide the, ne the next life, divide it by the life of this world today, and your answer is zero. That the life of this world is nothing. The Prophet ﷺ said, al kayis mandana nafsa wa amila lima ba'd al mawt wal ahmaq man atba'a nafsahu hawaha wa tamanna ala Allah al amani. The Prophet ﷺ said, al kayis the intelligent person, is the one who controls himself and he works for the life after death. You see, the long one. But the ahmaq, the idiot, the fool, is the one who lets himself go and then he hopes Allah will forgive him in the end. He's a fool. Because this life is only short. The next life, that is the real life. That is the real time of existence. Our existence here is a short time. But we are fooled in it. And so Allah tells us, whatever you have been given in this world, it is mata'ul hayat dunya But the, that which is with Allah will last eternally. If you do something for Allah, you spend in the path of Allah, you give your life for Allah, you do something, that will last forever. The money you spend here, is, you spend it and it's gone. You buy something and it's gone. You buy new pants. You buy new shoes. You buy a new cell phone. And you put it down, somebody steals your cell phone. Or you drop your cell phone, it's gone, it's in the water. It's destroyed. That's how the life in the Hayat dunya is. Secondly, in the survival program, the condition for the benefit in the survival program is two things. Alladina amanu is it is iman and tawakkul. That you believe in Allah and you depend upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are conditions. Number three, the further qualities, ijtinab al kabair, staying away from the major sins, staying away from shirk. Polytheism, asiha, magic, staying away from uh, eating interest, eating the wealth of orphans, accusing innocent Muslim women of wrong deeds, running away on the battlefield. Al kabair, study al kabair. Allah is saying. This is the survival program. If you want to survive here, find out what the kaba'ir are and stay away from them. Next, 
Allah tells us, avoid al-fawahish. Stay away from indecency and immorality. Look at what the society is giving to you. You look at the billboard, it has nakedness. You turn on the television, nakedness. On the internet, nakedness. You watch the movie and they fall in love. They're fighting aliens out in space and they fall in love. They're playing cricket and soccer and somebody falls in love. They're fighting uh, uh, animals, they fall in love. Why do they always fall in love? Why? Think about it. Why in every movie they must fall in love? It's erotica. It's from Eros, which is one of the gods of the Greeks. It is to make you think of your animal self, to keep you on the level of an animal, like a dog. It keeps you on an animal level, so you cannot think about Allah. That is the reason why Islam tells us you should dress properly, lower the gaze, purify yourself, protect yourself. Not just women, men also have to protect themselves. They have to dress properly. They have to lower their gaze. And by doing that, you will be protected. I was living in South Africa for 10 years. And in some parts of South Africa, one out of every three of the population is HIV positive. One of three. How is it being spread? Because people do not protect themselves. It spreads through zina, through adultery and fornication. And when they do that, the punishment comes. And so, staying away from al-fawahish, avoid indecency. And that does not just mean don't commit adultery. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَلَا تَقْرَ بُزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاهِشَةً وَسَاءَ السَّبِيلَ Do not come close to zina. He didn't say don't do it. He said don't come near it. So if there's something that leads you to it, avoid it. Because that is the trap that the evil one wants you to fall in. You fall in the trap, and you have un unwanted pregnancy, you have sexual transmitted diseases, your life is ruined, your future is destroyed for a few minutes of, of, of pleasure. وَمَا الْحَيَاةِ dunya illa mata al ghuru. The next point is an interesting point, and we need this today. It says, who are the people who will survive? It is those that when they are angry, they forgive. <laughs> if we get angry, we want to destroy somebody. We are angry. And we say, no, he's not in my school of thought. He's not in my Islamic movement. He, my sheikh is not his sheikh. He's not my tribe. He's not my nation. He doesn't speak my language. And so we get angry and we lose control of ourselves. When you are angry at the point of ghadab, forgive them. Forgive them. That is the example of the Prophet ﷺ. When he went to a ta'if, they stoned him. They stoned him until the blood ran down in his sandals. And the angel of the mountain came to him and said, I will destroy this people in words. And the Prophet ﷺ said, do not destroy them. Maybe there's somebody amongst them who will worship Allah, one God, and not associate partners. And he lived to see the people of a ta'if come into Islam in crowds. They came in large numbers. He lived to see this. He forgave them. So Muslim, number one, we need to forgive each other. You need to see another Muslim, he does something different to you, he says something against you, forgive him. That is the way of Islam. Have mercy upon each other. We will have to embrace people who come from another culture. Some of them are enemies. And you have to embrace them. It is reported in the 13th century that the Mongols, al maghul they came into the Muslim world and they killed millions of people. They would come to a city and cut off all the people's heads and put it in a pile. 
And Allah raised up Saif al-Din Qutus from Egypt. He united the Muslims and they defeated the Mongols in Ain Jalut. But after they defeated the Mongols, they gave dawah to the Mongols and some of the Mongols became Muslims. So now they had to embrace people who murdered them. But some of these Mongols became great leaders in Islam. That is the forgiveness, that is our message. We do not judge people, it is Allah Azza wa Jal who will judge. Allah knows what is in the heart of a person. Our job is to give the message. When they are angry, they forgive. The next point is Kalima Jamia. It says, وَالَّذِينَ اسْتَجَابُوا لِرَبِّهِمْ Istijab. They, they respond to their Lord. When you hear something, you learn some new things, respond to it. You learn a new part of the Sunnah, put it in your life. You get knowledge from the Qur'an, put it into your life. Tahseen tilawati, with the dabba ayati, itba awamari, follow it. Don't just say, oh that was a good speech. That was a beautiful ayah. Put it in your life. If Allah said don't do it, don't do it. If Allah said do it, do it. Respond to your Lord. Respond in all the things. And then Allah tells us, Iqamat salat They establish prayers in their life. Not just on special occasions. They establish a regular rhythm of salat in their life. They don't base their salat on their job. They make sure they have a time to make their prayers. If they're at school, if they're at jobs, wherever they are, they establish salat. Number eight, shura. وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورَ بَيْنَهُمْ They establish consultation. They talk to each other. Many of the problems in our families is because the husband does not talk to his wife. He will not talk to his wife. He stays out a long period of time with the brothers in the coffee shop. Some people, they chew in their cot, they chew the chat. And he chews. And he comes home after 24 hours from chewing. And he doesn't say anything nice to his family. He comes in, he does not talk to his wife, he does not kiss his children, he does not bring milk, because he's chewing the cot like a drug addict. He doesn't have the love in his heart. The problem is shura. If his wife said, I want to talk, sit down with your wife and take shura. Listen to her position. Maybe she has something to say to you which is better than what you know. Even the Prophet ﷺ took shura with his wives. And it is reported that Umm Salama radiallahu anha and many of the, of the Sahabiyat, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, they would give him shura. They would give him advice. He takes the advice. Shura. So we need to talk, our families, we need to talk to each other. Parents need to talk to these young children, talk to the young people. They speak a different language. These young kids, they play with the, with the, with the computer and the cell phone. There's a new generation. I was born in what they call BC. It sounds like, you know, it means before computers. Or you could say I was born in, in BFB before Facebook. <laughs> this new generation now, with, with computers and Facebook, they think in a different way. So we need to take sure with them, because they know some things we don't know. So take sure with the young people, ask them what they need. What is their opinion? What do they need to solve their problem? Don't just tell them, take sure. The, the, the good Amir takes sure with his jama'ah, and then he follows the best decision. It is reported that when the Mushrikeen of Quraysh came to uh, Medina, they were attacking Medina. <laughs> Hmm.